Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Alan Marie Hard, and I am the host of the Alan Marie Hard Show. My website is www.nallymariehart.com, where you can check out other exciting interviews. I am most grateful for supporters who follow me on my social medias. Before I introduce my guest onto the show, I wanted to speak about bullying and what it can do to people. Someone who is kind has the right to say no and someone treats you with rudeness. Be aware that kindness does not allow people to walk all over you. There are many psychopaths and sociopaths out there that like to go after people that give out kindness. I know there's a lot of kind people out there and they give in to these individuals that don't get respect others. So remember, if you're kind, don't allow people to walk all over you. We're creating a mean society. So let's think about others before we think about ourselves. Don't feel guilty if someone steps all over you. Just talk back to them. On a positive note, I like to speak about the beautiful tur no, turquoise stone necklace that I am wearing. Unfortunately, I think the video is cutting it out. <laughs> so, but here it is, if anybody can see that. I hope it's visible. Um, I think it has been getting rid of bad energies that some people have within. I would like to personally thank Dr. Robert Pomonius and Laura E. Courtner for sending this to me. It really made my day, and it's so beautiful. What makes the stone so beautiful is because, it's unique, because of its unique color, and it is a symbol of wisdom and protection. So thank you for that gift. Today, I have a special guest by the name of Graham Phillips. On April 23rd, 1564, a man who will make history will be born. A man who will become a poet, playwright, and an actor, known famous to all of us as William Shakespeare. His most famous plays are Romeo and Juliet, Othello, Macbeth, Hamlet, and much, much more. <laughs> who was the real writer behind his plays? He might have done many famous plays, but who was he? Today we're dedicating our show to Graham's book, The Shakespeare Conspiracy. In 1994, in his controversial book, Graham revealed historical evidence suggesting that William Shakespeare worked as a government spy. Let's find out more. I would like to introduce him onto my show. Hello, Graham. It's always an honor and a pleasure to interview you. How are you doing today? Hello. Um, very well indeed. Thank you. And it's always a pleasure to be on your show. Yes. If you could please be so kind, could you tell us about yourself? Well, I am an author of, I think it's about 18 books at the moment, non-fiction books on historical mysteries, everything from the Holy Grail, King Arthur, the Ark of the Covenant, and various historical figures such as Alexander the Great and Robin Hood. Did he really exist? And of all these books, I think probably my favorite that I wrote was the book about Shakespeare, because what I discovered was well, completely unexpected. I mean, when I started investigating Shakespeare, it was just not really for a book. It was just out of interest. There seemed to be a number of inconsistencies in the historical information about him. And I thought, well, why not just look into him? And I didn't really think I'd find out much. But what I found out was, to be quite honest, shocking. Wow. It sounds quite interesting, the topics that you discussed, and I know we've done many shows together, and William Shakespeare is always a fun character to discuss. So, could you please be so kind to tell us the story about William Shakespeare that is confirmed by historians? Okay, well, the basic story of William Shakespeare is that he was born in Stratford in central England. And at some point, he went to London, about 80 miles to the south. And there he became, in the 1590s, a, an actor and stagehand working at uh, one of the first ever theatres to be opened in London, called The Theatre, at a place called Shoreditch. And he was uh, working there as an actor and stagehand, and then he began to write his own plays. And throughout the 1590s, his plays became widely performed in the London theatre and elsewhere in the country. And he also acted in these plays and directed them. So in a way, 
theatre as we know it today was pretty much created by Shakespeare and his contemporaries in the late Elizabethan period. So you, he, he's writing these plays, they become immensely popular. Eventually, they are performed before the Queen, Elizabeth I. And they were, were the sensation of the time. Now, you might imagine that such a person would grow extremely rich by writing plays, but unfortunately not. Back in those days, playwrights and actors were paid very little, and he had to rely on other people to help support him in, in doing what he was doing. In fact, a playwright probably earned about the equivalent of what, what was then five pounds for a play that took him many months to write. Now, five pounds then would be worth about a thousand pounds a day or say $1,300. Not a lot of money for a good few months work. And quite clearly, he's not going to be able to live in very good condition. So we know from various records that survive in London at the public, uh, the, the National Archives in the borough of Kew in London, there are various documents pertaining to William Shakespeare, the actor, and we know that he is constantly in debt. He's, there are a number of cases where courts have tried to seize money from him, um, which is owed in taxes, and he's unable to pay it. And then the following year, he's still unable to pay it, and the sum goes up. And he's quite a lot of the time, he's actually on, on the run from the authorities who are, try, who are chasing him for debts. So he's not a, a rich guy, um, but he lives in a he, he lives in what a, a single room that he rents in a an area of London, very close to the theatre at Shoreditch in the parish of St Helens. And he lives there in a small little room in a house which is long ago been knocked down, so you can't go to see it. And um, he eventually does very well at writing the plays. And uh, ultimately, in, in, the 19, in 1599, a new theatre is built, the Globe, which is a more famous theatre than the original one in Shoreditch. This is the one that they have had reconstructed in London to look just like it would have done in Shakespeare's day. And him and his players continued to perform these plays, and they, they did very well, but still they weren't being paid very much. So he was, he was basically the struggling artist. And as we all know, his plays became famous the world over. And what makes Shakespeare so different from other playwrights? Do you recall that he is one of the most celebrated men in our day? Yeah, well, ev nearly every, per every school child in the English-speaking world has to learn some of Shakespeare's plays at some point in their life. We don't find this about... I mean, it would be difficult, really, for uh, most people to name another famous playwright of the Elizabethan period. Um, for those who are watching, just think, can you name another one? Those who are historians or people who are interested in literature in, or perhaps in the theatre might be able to name people like Ben Johnson and Christopher Marlowe. But most people don't know of any other other than Shakespeare. In fact, most people probably can't name any playwright in history before modern times. Um, and the ones we, we can name are probably people like uh, Oscar Wilde or George Bernard Shaw or Sheridan. Actually, they're all Irish. So in, I think English playwrights, Shakespeare stands out above them all. And because he's, uh, Shakespeare's works are studied throughout the world and have been for, for a good few hundred years, um, he is beyond any doubt the most famous and well-read playwright in history. I, well, I learned about William Shakespeare and read many of his plays. There are theories that he did not write his plays. If he did or not, it was a brilliant anyway. He was even inventing his own words. Quite an intelligent man indeed, with knowledge in languages, history, and even the geography of Europe. He wrote plays such as Romeo and Juliet that was set in Italy, and Hamlet that was set in Denmark. It seems as though Shakespeare was a very good researcher, even though he did not have the internet or library. So it seems to me that Shakespeare was highly educated. 
Well, it would seem so. I mean, from his plays, it seems that he's well traveled. Um, he's um, very well read. Um, they appear to be written, I mean, obviously by a literary genius, somebody with an imaginative, an imagination and a creativity unlike any other. But his basic knowledge of uh, the things he writes about shows a man who should be extremely well educated. And this is where the whole thing becomes rather interesting. <laughs> because Shakespeare is said to have been born in Stratford-upon-Avon, uh, which is this little town in the middle of England. Now, and if you go there today, there, it, it, that, there's a massive tourist industry around William Shakespeare there. There's a big theatre called the Swan Theatre where Shakespeare's plays are performed. There are, there's a place, a house, that Shakespeare was said to have been born in. And um, there's a place where his uh, wife was said to have been born. And, and all sorts of places. Everything in Stratford, in central England, is dedicated to Shakespeare. And the town makes a fortune off of the tourist trade. Now, what is fascinating is at the time, everybody knows Shakespeare now, but at the time that he wrote, very few people were interested in who the authors of these plays were. Um, in um, 1623, the first published edition of Shakespeare's works was printed. Uh, it's known as the First Folio. It has a, a, a depiction of Shakespeare on the, in, in, uh, 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 one of the pages early in the book, uh, a woodcut of the famous, balding, bearded gentleman we all know today. And, um, and his plays are, 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 are all printed up in that book. But the actual handwritten earlier versions of Shakespeare's plays don't survive. If anyone came up with one, it would be worth a fortune. So if anybody thinks they've got one in their, in their attic, it's worth a fortune. And well, we don't have any of Shakespeare's original plays in his own handwriting. But we do have, in 1623, the first published version of his works. Now, this is a few years after he died. And so Shakespeare's plays are very, very uh, popular, and they've been published. But then suddenly, in the mid-1600s, Britain or England and Wales descend into a bloody civil war. Um, and it's basically fought between the, the, the parliamentarians, the people who want to get rid of the king, and the royalists, the ones who want the king to stay. Eventually, the parliamentarians, known as the Roundheads, win. And they are Puritans. And the man who seizes control is a Puritan general by the name of Oliver Cromwell, and in the mid-1600s, he rules Britain as a dictator, rules England and Wales as a dictator. Scotland was a separate country at that point. Um, and during this time, he, as a Puritan, he thinks that uh, plays are decadent and they are banned. Theatres are closed and some are even burnt to the ground. And it is not until Oliver Cromwell dies and everyone's got fed up of this Puritan way of living, that a new king is put on the throne, Charles II, and everybody celebrates, basically, that they can go back to having a good time. And the theatres are reopened, and Shakespeare's plays are rediscovered. Now, this is a good few decades after they were originally written, and they become very popular indeed. And what's fascinating is that at this point, people say, well, who was this William Shakespeare? And because of all the turmoil that's been going on in this civil war and this period of Puritan rule by Cromwell, the, the, all the records, of, a lot of them have been lost. Nobody knows who, they know the name William Shakespeare, they know his plays, but who was the man? And this becomes the mystery. And the only clue as to who he might be is in this first published copy of his works in 1623, at the, at the beginning, there's a tribute written to William Shakespeare by one of his fellow writers, a man called Leonard Diggs. And Leonard Diggs, in this small tr tribute, this epitaph, if you like, to Shakespeare, he refers to Shakespeare's Stratford Monument. So, seemingly, Shakespeare has a monument in somewhere called Stratford. Now, it just so happens at the time that the vicar, the priest, of a church called Holy Trinity Church in Stratford in central England 
suddenly realizes that there is a William Shakespeare buried in his church. And on the wall just above where the grave is, is a monument showing the bust, the head and shoulders of a man. And this, it is said, is William Shakespeare, who died on the 23rd of April, 1616. So suddenly they think, wow, this is the William Shakespeare who wrote the plays. There's his monument in Stratford. And from that moment on, no one ever really questioned that William Shakespeare, the playwright who became famous in London, who spent most of his time living in London, was originally born in Stratford-upon-Avon in central England. Mm -hmm. Is there a possibility that Shakespeare was living a double life? Well, this, this double, it's funny you should mention the word double life because that's exactly what he seems to be doing. He goes, he, in London, as I've already said, all the records show that he is pretty poor. He lives in a squalid area of London. He lives in um, almost slum conditions. All he's doing is renting a single room. He's constantly unable to pay debts. And in fact, in... 1598, his in, when the tax collectors eventually catch up with him, his entire worldly possessions that they seize are worth five pounds, which is around about a thousand pounds or a hundred, uh, sorry, about a thousand pounds or one thousand three hundred dollars by today's value. So if you just had that kind of money, that's all you had in the world. These days, you couldn't even afford to live in London except for on the street. I mean, he was poor. Now, this is the fascinating thing about Stratford-upon-Avon. The William Shakespeare, who is buried in Holy Trinity Church in Stratford-upon-Avon, where the monument is, he is, um, to, to start off with, in, in the very same year, in 1597, when Shakespeare is being sought in London for not paying five shillings in tax, which would be about $130 now, for not paying that amount of money, and he's not able to pay the rent on his one-room apartment in a squalid area of London, it's exactly the same time William Shakespeare in Stratford-upon-Avon is recorded as buying the second largest house in the town for cash. And the amount of money he pays for it would be the equivalent of many, many tens of thousands of pounds a day. And this is when he's running out on debts in London of, of virtually nothing at all compared to what the sort of money he seems to have in Stratford-upon-Avon. This house he has in, 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 in Stratford, it no longer survives, but there's paint, there's drawings, old drawings of it, and it's a place fit for a lord. So that's exactly at the same time as he's living in squalid accommodation and unable to pay his debts in London. But that's not all. About a year later... Uh, shortly after that, he then buys 107 acres of land in Stratford, worth something like well over um, well over $100,000 by today's value. At the same time, as he's still being sought by the authorities in London for not paying his debts. And at the same time as Shakespeare can't afford to pay five shillings, let us say that's a hundred pounds in today's value. He, the records show that in Stratford, 80 miles to the north, he is being asked to lend somebody 30 pounds, which would be tens of thousands of pounds. So why? He seems to be leading a double life. He's a rich man in Stratford-upon-Avon and is a poor man in London. I mean, what's he doing? What's going on? What's the answer to this mystery? And that's what we're going to find out. I would like to play a clip made by my special guest, particularly for the show. Graham explains and investigates William Shakespeare in the short clip. William Shakespeare, born in 1564 in the town of Stratford, in central England. At some point he moves to London and in the 1590s 
when in his late twenties or early thirties, Shakespeare's plays begin to appear. The famous Globe Theatre wasn't built until 1599, so Shakespeare and his players were performing at the theatre at Shoreditch, a couple of miles to the north. The plays were extraordinarily popular and even performed before the Queen, Elizabeth I. But then, during the 1600s, England descended into civil war. The victors, the Roundheads, deposed the monarchy, and the Puritan general, Oliver Cromwell, seized control. Cromwell's Puritan regime considered performing arts decadent, theatres were forcibly closed, and some burned to the ground. But in 1660, after Cromwell's death, the monarchy was restored, and Charles II became king. The theatres were reopened, and Shakespeare's plays experienced a grand revival. The problem, however, after years of turmoil, no one now knew who Shakespeare was. They knew the name, but nothing of the author himself. The only clue was found in the first published copy of Shakespeare's works, printed in 1623. Known as the First Folio, it contains a tribute written to Shakespeare by his fellow writer Leonard Diggs. Here, Diggs refers to Shakespeare's Stratford Monument. And in 1662, John Ward, the vicar of Stratford in central England, realises that there is a monument to a William Shakespeare in his church. The church of Holy Trinity still survives today, as does the monument. It is set in a wall above the grave of a William Shakespeare who died on April the 23rd, 1616, aged 53. Not only does it date from the right time, it actually depicts the familiar image of the balding bearded playwright holding a feather pen and paper, the tools of his trade. So there could be no doubt that this was the William Shakespeare who wrote the plays. Or can there? The Shakespeare Centre in Stratford contains nearly every historical record pertaining to the William Shakespeare who was buried in the town in 1616. But amongst them there are no plays, poems or even letters written by William Shakespeare. In fact there is nothing to associate him with literary activities of any kind. They only concern commercial matters. Indeed, amongst all the documentation of the period, there is nothing to suggest that anyone in Stratford during Shakespeare's lifetime considered him to be anything other than a businessman, making his money as a grain merchant. This, together with the evidence showing that he received only the most basic elementary education, has led some scholars to believe that Shakespeare was merely a frontman for works written by someone else, such as Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford, or the statesman Sir Francis Bacon. The problem with these theories, however, why choose an apparently poorly educated grain merchant to front such splendid and studious works? Nevertheless, there is a William Shakespeare recorded as working as both an actor and a playwright at the Shoreditch Theatre in London in the 1590s. But such people earned little money, and the records bear this out. The National Archives in the London suburb of Kew contain original documentation concerning this William Shakespeare. Between 1597 and 1600, he was living in the London parish of St Helens, about midway between the Shoreditch and Globe theatres. Here he rented a single room in a squalid and run-down area. 
On the 15th of November 1597, he is recorded as not having paid his taxes of five shillings, around a hundred pounds or a hundred and thirty dollars by today's standards. The following year, he still hasn't paid it, nor the year after that, by which time he is officially recorded as a tax evader owing a total of just over 13 shillings. By the 6th of October 1600 the amount seems to have been seized and Shakespeare's entire assets are valued at £5. Just £2,000 or $2,500 by today's value. In London William Shakespeare was indeed the epitome of the struggling artist. However, all the records concerning William Shakespeare in Stratford tell a very different story. In 1597, he buys one of the largest houses in the town. Called New Place, it was a home fit for a lord. This is at exactly the same time as he is renting squalid accommodation in London and in 1598, at the same time as Shakespeare in London, is being sought for not paying paltry sums of money, a letter dated the 25th of October concerns Shakespeare in Stratford lending the modern equivalent of £12,000 or $16,000. And in 1602, shortly after Shakespeare's total assets worth just £5 have been seized in London for tax evasion, a surviving document from Stratford shows he purchased 107 acres of land for £320. In today's money, that would be well over $150,000. And how was he making all this money? Writing plays? No. The Stratford records show that he dealt in wheat, malt and barley. As a grain merchant, William Shakespeare seems to have been leading a bizarre double life. In Stratford, a successful and wealthy entrepreneur. In London, an impoverished poet, playwright and actor. But why? It is almost as if we were dealing with two separate men. Indeed, as none of Shakespeare's works survive in his original handwriting, this could just possibly be the answer. But what about the monument that first suggested that the London playwright originally came from Stratford? It clearly depicts the bard we all know and love. For over 300 years, the people of Stratford have gathered annually to celebrate Shakespeare's birthday. A grand parade makes its way through the town to arrive at Holy Trinity Church, where their William Shakespeare is buried. Once inside, they lay wreaths at the foot of his monument. But little do they know that this is not the original. It dates from 1748, well over a century after the death of the person it portrays. It was made in its present form after the monument was damaged. Luckily, in 1656, an historian of church architecture, Sir William Dugdale, made a drawing of the original here, from local records, is the restored monument of 1748. While this is Dugdale's picture from his book, Antiquities of Warwickshire, showing the monument in the mid-1600s, well before it was restored. Such tomb memorials showed the deceased's trade. And we can clearly see that the William Shakespeare who was buried here in 1616 is depicted not as a writer, but a dealer in bagged commodities, which is exactly what the Stratford records reveal, a grain merchant. It seems that in the 18th century, the good people of Stratford decided that the tomb memorial of their town's famous son should be shown not only as a writer, 
but also be reconstructed to more resemble the image of Shakespeare portrayed in the first folio. But if there really were two William Shakespeare's, and it's possible William is a common name, and in Elizabethan times so was Shakespeare, how do we account for Leonard Diggs's reference to the Stratford Monument? Well, there are in fact two Stratfords, one in central England and the other in London. It is now a borough in London's East End, but in Elizabethan times it was a small village less than five miles from where Shakespeare, the playwright, was living. Could this have been where the Stratford Monument stood? and where the bard was really born or died? Where the Stratford Village Church once stood is now the site of the stadium built for the 2012 Olympics. So it is just possible that the bones of history's most famous playwright actually lie beneath this sacred turf. Thank you for watching this clip. And now, he will explain to our audience, in other words, more about the true life of William Shakespeare. As we know... Whoa. Oh, sorry, continue. <laughs> William and Shakespeare were common names. So was he? Or Continue, please. Yeah, well, uh, as, as you've seen in that clip, um, there is the possibility that uh, there were two William Shakespeare's one living in Stratford-upon-Avon in central England, and another one who may have come from the area of Stratford, a little village near London, um, at the same time. So you could have two William Shakespeare's. The name William is still a common name. Shakespeare is actually far more common in Elizabethan times than it would be today. So William Shakespeare, there could be more than one, um, but there's no actual proof of this. It's just in my mind, the only thing that kind of makes any sense about this strange double life that Shakespeare seems to be leading. All the records in Stratford-upon-Avon pertain to his business activities, to him, him buying malt, barley and wheat. He's a green merchant. That's how all the records portray him. Any record, any letters that are sent between people in stratford upon avon about Shakespeare referred to him as a businessman. In fact, there's not one piece of evidence anywhere that survives from Stratford in central England to show that anyone during his lifetime ever thought that he was a playwright at all. And as you saw in that clip, even the bust of him, the, the monument in the Stratford church is a fake. It was made during the 1700s when Stratford-upon-Avon had already become a, a tourist um, att attraction. And so they wanted a bus that best fitted the William Shakespeare that everybody knows. So they have him there with his pen and his paper. Whereas the original monument shows a man with his hands on a sack, showing that the person, the William Shakespeare who was buried in the church in 1616, was in fact a dealer in bagged commodities. He's a green merchant, just like all the records show. Okay, if it isn't two separate William Shakespeare's, and unfortunately one would say, well, can't we go to Stratford in London and look up all the records and find out if there's a Shakespeare born there or died there? The problem is that during the war, that part of London was heavily bombed um, and um, many, many records have been lost, including all those that concern the, the parish that, of, of Stratford near London. Um, so we're, we're never going to know, but there is one, the only real piece of evidence to suggest that they are one and the same person other than just their names is that Shakespeare of Stratford-upon-Avon's will does leave a certain amount, uh, he leaves a certain amount of money to a couple of the people who were actors at the Globe Theatre at the same time that Shakespeare was. So people would say, well, it's got to be the same guy. 
Now, if this is true, he certainly was leading a double life. It's my belief that there might have been a bit of fakery going on. I want to try and examine that original will to see if the um, to see if the reference to Shakespeare leaving something to these so supposedly fellow actors was perhaps added on afterwards um, when people started saying. Shakespeare didn't come from Stratford upon Avon. He doesn't seem to be the same guy. He didn't even have an education, the man in Stratford upon Avon, except for the most basic elementary education. Um, he, he couldn't have been the person who wrote the plays. And what's how? How can he be in two places at the same time? Exactly. So it's all. It, there were, so for the for the tourist industry in Stratford upon Avon, at some point over the last couple of hundred years, it would certainly be worth somebody adding this little piece onto the will to connect the two people together but unless that particular document is properly examined which i'm trying to get the you know to get done um there's no way really of knowing if it proves to be genuine then fair enough it is the same man and he was leading a double life if it's a fake then we could be talking of two separate people but if he is leading a double life um we've just got to ask why we have to speculate. And were he trying to visit Shakespeare's house? And didn't they try to ban you? Oh, when my book first came out and I started suggesting things that Shakespeare may not have come from Stratford upon Avon, um, in Stratford there is an actual, uh, there's, a, there's a house dating from Elizabethan times in Henley Street. And it is said to be Shakespeare's birthplace. And what they've set up there is something called the Birthplace Trust. It's part of a whole kind of Shakespeare theme center. The house is, uh, attached to the house is now a, the, what's called the Shakespeare Center. It's a visitor center with a library and all documents about Shakespeare, a reading room and, and all the rest of it. Um, and it's that place that I was banned from when my book came out. They actually used to have a photograph of me underneath the reception desk in case I came in so they could recognize me and, and usher me out. That's all changed now. The people who used to run the place are, have gone and they, they, quite like, they quite like me there now. They say, oh, any, any controversy about Shakespeare is good fun. Um, whether they'll ever let me get this, uh, this uh, will examined is another story altogether. But what's fascinating is that the house that is said to be his birthplace probably wasn't. We do know, and this is the William Shakespeare who was definitely born in Stratford-on-Avon. He did, a, he was born, he, he was born in a, obviously in a house in Stratford. Mm -hmm. But which house, none of the documents tell us. We do know that Shakespeare's father did at one point own a house in Henley Street, but there were dozens of houses in Henley Street. It may or may not have been this particular one that's now open to the public. Um, and the fact is, it might not have even been one of the houses in Henley Street at all that Shakespeare was born in, because Shakespeare's father, he owned a number of houses. He was a glover. He actually made quite a lot of money himself. Um, and so, he might not have even, the chances of him actually being born in that house, and when you go there, they'll show you a room with a bed in which he's supposed to have been born. Um, the chances are, let's say there's 200 houses in Henley Street. The chances are one in 200 that it was that house that Shakespeare's father owned. And because he owned three houses, then there's only a, there's a one in 300 chance that you're actually in the right place. And I also want to talk about Shakespeare's marriage life. He was married to Anne Hathaway. He had three children, as you know. And was he really a family man? Well, the William Shakespeare of Stratford-on-Avon certainly was. Um, he seems to have been a loving father. He had three children. He seems to have certainly provided for them. There was, there was plenty provided for all his children in his will. However... He didn't provide for his wife. Now, Anne Hathaway, his wife, you can also go near Stratford to a house that's open to the public, which is Anne Hathaway's cottage, which is where she lived as a, a child before she married Shakespeare, became Anne, Anne Shakespeare. 
in his will, which incidentally is drawn up by somebody else. Most poets and playwrights, their own will they'd write and they would use it as like a personal epitaph to themselves. Shakespeare's is simply a document drawn up by a lawyer and he signs the bottom of it. That's all there is. Um, and in this will, he provides for his children. But the only thing he leaves his wife, he doesn't leave anything except for one thing, his second best bed. Now, if that isn't an insult, I don't know what is. Leaving her nothing is bad enough. But to leave her his second best bed, who did his best bed go to? It sounds very much as if he had a mistress on the side who is not included in the will, but certainly his will seems to have been aimed at snubbing his wife. But in London, the Shakespeare, that's certainly the one that wrote the plays, who lives in the parish of St. Helens, close to the Shoreditch Theatre, not far from the Globe, he is he's constantly getting into trouble with the law for being drunk and disorderly, uh, on another occasion, he, uh, there's a, um, a writ that's um, put out against him by the courts to keep him away from a fellow actor whose life he's threatened. He certainly seems to have been the kind of person in London who may have been involved with all sorts of different people and may have had many girlfriends. There's no record of him actually being married in London. So if he is a different person, we have no record that the William Shakespeare, the playwright, actually did get married. I can't believe that uh, Shakespeare will leave his wife his second best bet. What kind of a guy does that? Clearly, as you said, he must be having an affair. But do you think there was a possibility that Shakespeare was a homosexual? People have suggested this. The Remember I said how poor William Shakespeare is in London. Now, if he is the same man, he's got plenty of money back home. Um, but let's just go on the assumption that it isn't the same man. The person who's living in London, writing these plays, is poor, like other playwrights. He needs a patron. And the person, and normally people who patronized, um, poets and playwrights were wealthy people. And in his case, the person who did patronize Shakespeare was the Earl of Southampton. Now, he was rich. In other words, he would give money to help Shakespeare pay off his debts. And, and, and also to basically help stage these plays, pay for the upkeep of the plays and pay the actors and so forth. So Shakespeare's patron was the Earl of Southampton, and he is known to have been gay um, quite openly. It wasn't considered uh, particularly bad in Elizabethan times. It wasn't until much later on, after the Puritan era of Oliver Cromwell I was talking about, that, that, uh, that gayness was considered to be um, more of a sin. In Shakespeare's time, especially if you had plenty of money like the Earl of Southampton, it didn't matter. So the Earl of Southampton is gay. Shakespeare writes sonnets addressed to the Earl of Southampton that seem to be like um, as if he is writing to a lover. Now, if you just take it at face value, it would seem that Shakespeare is writing love poems to the Earl of Southampton. But this is not necessarily true. It's probably just that he was writing poems to flatter the Earl of Southampton, knowing that the Earl of Southampton was gay. There's no evidence whatsoever that Shakespeare had any kind of affair with him. So it's possible that he was gay, but um, it's equally possible that, um, you know, that he wasn't at all. Mm -hmm. Yes. And could Shakespeare have plagiarized the stories of others? Well, there is uh, a th the, the, the theory, because the, the records in Stratford-upon-Avon showing a rich, wealthy grain merchant don't tie up with the records in London showing this struggling playwright. Um, some people have said, well, because Shakespeare of Stratford-upon-Avon didn't have the background or the education to have written these plays, they must have been written by someone else. And people have suggested it could be the, um, the statesman, Francis Bacon, and others have suggested it was the Earl of Oxford. And in fact, a whole film about uh, Shakespeare's plays being written by the Earl of Oxford has actually been made. Um, but in my opinion, 
and that, 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 that's the, the general idea is that that the Earl of Oxford or somebody else didn't want to write the plays in their own name because being a playwright wasn't considered a thing for a, a lord to do. So he wrote them and then used Shakespeare as a front man. Well, if you're talking about the, Str the Shakespeare from Stratford upon Avon, why use a front man who clearly hasn't got a higher education, doesn't seem to have been involved in literary activities of any kind, and in fact works and makes his money as a grain merchant. Why choose some obscure grain merchant to front your plays? Why not choose somebody in the theatre in London already that's established as a playwright, um, like a person I mentioned earlier, like Ben Johnson, for example, and have him front your plays? It doesn't make sense. If you're going to have someone front the plays, you know, that can't explain this strange double life. There's got to be another explanation. So that, that, that's why I've kind of tended to disregard the idea that the William Shakespeare, who is performing at the Shoreditch and then Globe theatres, writing plays for them, um, who is poor and living in this parish of St. Helens, I do believe that he is the man who actually did really write the plays. I don't really see there's a proper argument for the fact that he didn't. We don't know enough or anything about his background if he is a different person to the man in Stratford-upon-Avon. And in fact, if you are talking about two separate people, it really clears up a lot of the mystery surrounding him. Well, whoever will replace, we can only speculate because there are many theories out there, right? And is it possible that Shakespeare was a government spy? Well, that's, that's another thing I got into a lot of trouble with and they decided not to let me go into the Shakespeare Center. Um, one of the, if it, going by the fact that there were two, just, just looking at the, 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 the evidence that he's leaving this strange double life, if he is the same man, I tried to find some explanation for that. And certainly he could have worked as a government spy. Now, that might sound strange, but just before Shakespeare became famous in the early 1590s, there's a playwright, Elizabethan playwright called Christopher Marlowe. Now, he did work for, he's known to have worked for the English government as a spy. Now, the, the reason why is that playwrights were often actors in their own plays. They would sometimes perform at the theatres in London, but they'd also travel around the country to the various stately homes of the rich and wealthy, the lords around the country. And they would perform and there were one lot of people who could mix in all sorts of different societies because although they might have come from rather humble beginnings, when they were performing their plays in the stately homes, the, the, the owners would get friendly with them. They'd all be getting drunk together. And of course, they would talk. Now, England at the time, there were, it was very uncertain times politically because um, before Elizabeth had come to the throne, the queen before her, her sister Mary, who's known as Bloody Queen Mary, was a Catholic who was executing Protestants. Now, Queen Elizabeth came to the throne, and she's a Protestant. Now, she's not going around executing Catholics, but she's not treating them too well either. Now, the government of Elizabeth wants to make sure that there's not a plot to overthrow Queen Elizabeth to put a Catholic monarch on the throne. Her cousin, Mary, Queen of Scots. Now, in order to do this, the Secretary of State, the equivalent of the Prime Minister, if you like, at the time, a man called Walsingham, Francis Walsingham, sets up England's first secret service. That's the secret service that later, in fiction, James Bond becomes part of, or MI5. He sets up the secret service, and the idea is to... For, to, to, to um, get together people who can spy on the activities of the various lords throughout the country to see which ones might want to lean towards Catholicism and overthrow the Queen. And the best people to act, to act as these informers were playwrights and actors who would travel around the country. And Walsingham is known to have 
employed a number of actors and the playwright Christopher Marlowe. Now, Marlowe eventually seems to have been um, caught out at his spying game because in 1593 he's murdered and suddenly disappears from the scene altogether. Well, he's dead. <laughs> but some people say he wasn't killed, but he just went into hiding. So one way or the other, he stops writing plays. At exactly that time, shit, at this point, Christopher Marlowe has been like the star of the stage. He was more famous than any other playwright. And his plays were being for, performed at the Curtin Theatre in London, which was near the Shortage Theatre, where Shakespeare later worked. And in 1593, Shakespeare is working at the Curtin Theatre, it seems, as just a stagehand and perhaps an actor. The moment that Christopher Marlowe disappears from the scene, suddenly Shakespeare's plays are performed. Shakespeare immediately gets the, um, the backing of various people in high places to perform his plays. Uh, money is put into, into staging them. And Shakespeare's plays are promoted, and he then becomes the top playwright almost overnight. Where Marlowe had been before, Shakespeare takes over that position. And it has been suggested that William Shakespeare, the reason why he was so well publicized, if you like, and, and people patronized his works, is because they needed someone to replace Marlowe as the super spy, if you like. And so while Shakespeare was traveling around the country performing his plays, he could take over the job of listening in on to drunken talk and reporting back to Walsingham about who might actually be a, um, a, 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 a sympathy with the Catholic cause to overthrow Queen Elizabeth. So there's a possibility. There's no proof of that. But that, that is one of the things I looked into is to explain how he might have been a, leading a double life. But it still doesn't explain why he's working as a grain merchant in one place and a poor playwright somewhere else. So there's, there's mysteries all over the place in Shakespeare's life. Yes, there is mysteries, but you do have a point. And they also say that Shakespeare has a connection to the Bible, that he could have even written the King James Version of the Bible according to internet and theories on the internet. What do you have it, to yes, it's an interesting point. The, the James I Bible, that's the one we all know and love today, the these and thous in it. The reason it has got all that, it sounds very like a Shakespeare play, is because that is the way that people spoke in those times. It's called early modern English. It's not actually old English, old English. You wouldn't even understand it today. It's more like German. Um, but this is what's called early modern English. Okay. And in 1616, James the first or produced the first widely um, uh, disseminated English version of the Bible, which had before had been written in Latin. And he must, James I himself, who was the king after Elizabeth, didn't actually do the writing and the translating on his own. He patronized someone to do it. And people have suggested it could have been William Shakespeare. The only thing is that Shakespeare in 1616, if, it, if he's the one from Stratford, he's probably already dead <laughs> by the time that comes out. That doesn't mean he hasn't, he hasn't been working on it. If he's not the one from Stratford, he could still be alive. He could be working on it. But so could many other playwrights, including, um, well, Ben Johnson for a start, who I've mentioned before. But it is possible. Um, he seems to have been about around at the right time to have done it. James I, like Elizabeth before him, certainly enjoyed Shakespeare's plays. And in his reign, in the early 1600s, he actually forms, he actually calls Shakespeare's troop of actors the King's Men. So he was very, um, uh, very keen on Shakespeare. So yes, he could have, he could have done it. And whoever will the Shakespeare plays, may it be him or his double identity, or may it be Sir Francis Bacon, or even a woman, whoever will it, it'll be a mystery, definitely. <laughs> Could you please be so kind 
to tell us your social medias and website? Yes, indeed. Um, my website is grahamphillips.net. Um, if you go to uh, that, you'll find on the front page, first page of my website, grahamphillips.net, you'll see all the different covers of my books. You just click on those and there's a good few pages with lots of pictures telling you all about what all my books are um, and, 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 you know, give you a good idea of what's in them. Um, and there you will also find a link to my Facebook page, which you are free to, you know, please join. Um, and also the book we've been talking about today is the Shakespeare Conspiracy. There's a page on that, but I, that, that came out so long ago. Um, and it's called the Shakespeare Conspiracy because back then the word in the 1990s, when that book came out, the word conspiracy was not a dirty word like it is today, but the conspiracy that I talk about in, in the book is actually all about the fact that he might have been a government spy. So that's where the word comes in. Um, so, um, yeah, you click on that, you can see a bit about it. You should be able to find old copies online somewhere. It's no longer in print, but I'm pretty sure there must be a number of them out there on Amazon. That sounds fantastic, and please check that out. Yes, we have spoken about Graham's book, The Shakespeare Conspiracy. Let's remember William Shakespeare as what he was, a wonderful playwright. We know that his plays will be remembered throughout history and he will always be the famous playwright that everybody loves. If you wish to learn more about Graham Phillips, please go to his website, www.grahamphillips.net. I would like to thank you for making time out of your busy schedule to come on to the Now and Me Hot Show. I really enjoyed our interview and I hope to interview you in the near future. Thank you very much indeed. I would like to thank those who have watched Now and Me Hard Show. You can check out my website, www.nowandmehard.com, or on my Facebook, Now and Me Hard, or Twitter, Crystal Kid Radio. Love, peace, and harmony, and love you all.